Hi, everyone. I'm Liam Howlett, and I work for Oracle. Welcome to the discussion about the structures and algorithms of the maple tree. So I'm going to talk a bit about the general idea of the maple tree and how it differs from other trees and how it's similar. Uh, I'm going to go over why we wrote the tree, the benefits and reasons to use it. And then we'll go into the uh, node details, uh, show some small tree examples, and then get into the algorithm of uh, lookup and storing or modifications to the tree. Uh, so the maple tree meets most of the B tree requirements. What makes the maple tree special is the ability to store ranges. Uh, one entry can be found by multiple in uh, indices. Uh, one index can still uh, reference one entry, um, but it's less efficient with today's implementation. We'll be looking at fixing that in the near future. Uh, another benefit to the maple tree is the RCU protection on readers. This means writers uh, don't have to uh, hold up the readers. Uh, there's also some terminology differences. Uh, we call uh, where we store entries slots, and the pivots are usually referred to as keys. Um, the keys, uh, we, we use pivots uh, with index and last as the range uh, for a particular entry. Uh, we call it pivots because uh, it can, as I said earlier, it's for many keys. Uh, so. Uh, just to kind of point out the difference there. So B trees historically extend uh, existed to speed up disk, disk access. Uh, the maple tree has been designed to optimize for uh, cache hits. Uh, basically, instead of going to RAM, we try to do everything in the CPU cache. Each node is a uh, size to be four cache lines. That makes it so that there are less dereferences than the RB tree. Uh, mainly because of the branching factor, the RB tree either has to go to the next or the previous, uh, or uh, is a current, which is basically a branching factor of three, uh, whereas the maple tree nodes have up to a branching factor of 16. You can see more about that in the LPC 2019 talk on the maple tree, the sweet data, the sweetest data structure, uh, the QR code on the screen. Certain types of trees, uh, notably the radix tree, uh, the null entries occupy a lot of space. The maple tree reduces the null entries to a single, uh, a single entry when they're grouped together. Uh, you can see more about that on the LBC 2022 talk on the maple tree condensing 40 liters of data into one. Uh, I'll also be touching on that in the next slide. Right now, uh, we're working on optimizing the write speed, uh, including adding another node type uh, called a dense node uh, for a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, that's for the singleton storage. Uh, there's also some other node types in uh, planning stage as well. So if you look at the radix tree, uh, it stores nulls and it links uh, it links consecutive entries back to the previous entry. Uh, for instance, if in this example here, we have uh, a grouping at 512 to 1023, and there is an entry in 512. So 513 to 1023 will be linked back to that one 512 entry. Uh, and then the other entries are expanded out into another node below that. Um, so uh, the maple tree would be able to do this in a single node, whereas the radix tree has multiple nodes. You can see, again, more information about the radix tree and the maple tree in the LPC 2022 talk. So the reason the maple tree was written was uh, to better store the virtual memory areas. It was introduced in the 6.1 kernel. and uh, it was first used for the virtual memory areas in that kernel. It replaced the RB tree with a doubly linked list and the VMA cache. Uh, without updating the locks, the performance was about the same. Between 6.4 and 6.6 .6 kernel releases, uh, the locking was updated to introduce the per VMA locking. Uh, 
and each consecutive release uh, increased uh, the number of uh, page faults handled by the per VMA locking with increased performance. Surin and uh, Matthew did most of this work. Um, and then uh, to, to the right there again uh, is a QR code where you can scan to see that patch set or those patch sets. Uh, later on, the user fault FD operation was updated to use per VMA locking as well, with the Android garbage collection lock contention being the issue. Uh, and as you can see, there was a compaction in, uh, performance increase and an uninterruptible sleep time uh, decrease as well. Uh, that is a very user visible uh, thing that happened on Android runtime. Uh, so it was, uh, it was really nice to see this go in. Uh, there are a lot of other users in the in the Linux kernel of the Maple Tree at this point. Um, one of them was the FS uh, libfs switching um, from the X array when they first implemented the uh, libfs change uh, with the X array. There was a a re reduction in performance of about fifteen point five percent. Changing to the Maple Tree decreased that uh, that. Uh, reduction to uh, 3.7%. So that was significantly faster to use the maple tree. Um, but we suspect we'll be able to improve even that uh, performance when we implement the uh, dense nodes for the singletons. So looking at the maple tree nodes, the internal structure of, of the nodes in the tree. Uh, today, the tree exists with nodes that store 64-bit pointers. Each node can contain up to 16 entries with 15 pivots. Uh, the root node contains from zero to infinity. Uh, in the kernel, infinity is actually really U long max. So they those two, zero and U long max, don't need to be actually stored in the tree as they are implied. So each subsequent level of the tree uh, takes the implied uh, min and max from the parent node. Looking at a small uh, tree sample of height two, um, you can see that the root node has the implied zero to infinity uh, and pivot zero has a 100 value in this example. Uh, showing the first leaf node or the first child node of the root node, we see that slot zero has an implied zero uh, minimum, which was, um, inherited from the parent's minimum. And the 100 pivot zero with the value of 100 implies the maximum of this node to be 100. The node after that, uh, slot one node, would have a minimum of 101. So looking at the same same example, but with a little bit more information, we've added. I've added some uh, pivots here below uh, values, so uh, you can see the ranges depend on the pivot, which is inclusive. So zero to five is in the first slot, six to ten in the second slot, and eleven to fifteen in the third of this uh, child node. Um, if we were to look up a value of eight. First, we would search the root node to find where eight would fall, and it would be in the first slot, slot zero, because it's between zero to 100. And then we would go to the child node and find where um, the first pivot that is equal to or greater than uh, eight, which would be 10. So it would be six to 10, and we would return the entry in this selected slot here. So the right. The maple tree, the writes uh, are slower than the reads. We, we prioritize lookups over at the expense of modifications. I'm right, traditional B trees expand on the way down. So um, any implementation I've seen when the tree is almost full or the node is full, as it walks down, the node will be split so that there is space to store uh, the information that you're about to write. That doesn't actually work with ranges um, because you may actually be com 
compressing the data or reducing reducing the data stored in a particular node. So you don't actually know that you need to split until you get to the child node. Um, when a write occurs, you may replace directly replace something, uh, the entire range, um, or you may actually split that range leaving a portion at the start and putting a new a new portion, or you may actually overwrite the middle of a range, which in fact adds two to the total entries in a particular node. Uh, you may actually also overwrite multiple entries all the way up to overwriting the entire tree from zero to infinite. infinite. Um, so you have to really decide once you reach uh, usually the leaf node, uh, on what type of store operation is going to be performed. So the direct replacement is the first type of write that I'm going to talk about. It's the fastest, and basically it's just overwrites the entry. If we look at an example tree, similar to the previous example, um, first, when we're storing uh, 6 to 10, uh, we'll look for the range where six to 10 falls by walking the tree. We walk the tree down again to the, the first leaf node because six is falls within zero to 100. And then we find the six to 10 range. We realize that this is a, uh, a direct replacement. Uh, what's really nice about the direct replacements is that you don't actually need to uh, use a new node. Uh, it's RCU safe to just replace the entry. So we just put the new uh, entry into the slot and we're done. Uh, so the, the next type is a node replacement. This is something that uh, because of the RCU nature of the tree, uh, it often rules out reusing existing nodes. So we need to kind of uh, create a new node uh, allocate it, build it up, and insert it into the tree. It's worth looking at to get familiar with uh, with the operations. So if we were to store, uh, say, 8 to 9 to the previous example, um, notice that it's slightly different here that the implied 100 is no longer implied because it's actually stored where there's a, a extra space in this node to uh, to expand out the data. So first thing we do is we walk down again to the range where we'll be storing that data. And we realize that, yeah, it's gonna have to be a node store. So we allocate a new node and we copy in the first two entries. Um, So when we copy in the first two entries, we copy uh, the entry that will be partially overwriting, mainly because uh, the store will not completely replace it. So we will need to modify the range. And that happens once we store the new data, we overwrite the old pivot uh, to shorten the range. So instead of it being 10, we're now seven. And that seven means that this range is six to seven, which means the next one starts at eight. Um, and we write nine here to limit the range of this particular slot to uh, nine, and we put the new data in. And then we have to store the remainder of the slot that we're splitting here because it's six to 10, and uh, we only have accounted up to nine of the previous. We have to uh, put the, uh, the same data in as it was there before to cover up to 10. And then we simply copy the remainder of the data of slot zero node into the new node. So you see that in this example, we've actually grown the node by two by only writing a single value. Um, so that happens because again, we split that range up by writing to the middle of it. So after we've got our new node, we install a new node into the root node by replacing uh, the previous slot zero node with the new entry or the new slot zero node. So 
So splitting nodes, when we run out of space in a particular node, we have to split uh, into two nodes, but that's not as, um, that's not as uh, efficient um, or it, it if, if we split, we reduce the, uh, uh, the concentration of data. And uh, to, to try and avoid that, we push data to one of the siblings if we can. So basically, instead of splitting a node, if we can, we rebalance with the previous node. So we push the data always to the left uh, if we can. And if we can't, we push it to the right. And if we can't do either, then we're forced to split. When we split, it may propagate up many levels. If the parent's full, we have to split the parent if we can't push left or right. But we always try to push left or right on splitting um, just to reduce uh, the fragmentation of data as well as the, the number of nodes uh, used and the churn of the tree itself. Uh, if you get to the root node and that's full, then you're forced to split the root, which will grow the tree height. So if we have an example here again, uh, similar to the previous one, we now have a full uh, leaf node and the parent node has an extra slot here that we can use um, in, in the working area. So we're storing eight to nine again. Uh, so it's gonna cause this node to overflow, but we don't know until again, we walk down and we find the slot uh, and we calculate, we calculate the required slots when we calculate the required slots, we realize that there's not enough. Um, we try to push to the left, but in this case, there is no left node. So we try to push to the right node in the parent, and that's full, so we're forced to split. So we create two new nodes, and we figure out exactly where the data is going. You can see here um, by the... Uh, You can see here by the colors that uh, the um, the purple portion is going to go to the first new node, and the the kind of pale color is going to go to the uh, the second new node. Um, with the eight nine insert, we know we're going to be growing this node by two, so we're going to split at this particular location because that is about even. Actually, I think it's exactly even. Uh, between the two nodes. So the first thing we do is we copy uh, slot zero node up to the insert location, including the insert uh, range where we're going to be inserting. And then we do again, we overwrite the uh, the pivot to limit the uh, the insert location to seven and we store the new value and we write the new pivot uh, value of nine. And then we copy the remainder of the data all the way up to the split, including that not completely overwritten, uh, what was it, 6 to 10 into after 9. So now it's just 10 is going to point to this value. And also uh, 6 to 7 will also point to the same, the same entry. And then we copy uh, the remainder of the node from split to the end of slot 0 node into the second new node. Notice that we have to install the pivot that was previously implied into uh, new, the new node, uh, the second new node. So shrinking the, the slot zero node down so that we can have working room here, um, we create a new root node and we, must in, we copy uh, from the old root to the new root, uh, but there's up to the insert location, but there is no insert location, so we don't copy anything in this case. Then we insert the new no the first new node and the second new node. The split of the previous node, this uh, pivot here, will be the same as the pivot in the root, and the 100 remains the same uh, because these two nodes now contain the range that the first node contained in the old tree. And then we have to copy the remainder of the entries. Uh, notice that the last pivot here kind of gets pushed off the end and it's now implied. 
but that would have the infinite or uh, a U long max uh, value that the kernel expects anyways. Uh, so it's going to become an implied entry or implied uh, pivot. So then we just simply replace uh, the new root node. In, the, in this case, it's the new root node. It could be a parent node of uh, a larger tree that gets replaced, but in here, it's just a, basically a whole new tree. So besides that, we have uh, a rebalance. And uh, so in uh, B trees, we, we know they're, they're self-balancing. It's no different here with the maple tree. Any operation that requires a rebalance will occur and the tree will be continuously balanced. Uh, insufficient nodes are nodes that don't have enough data. Uh, in B trees, it's about half the slots that need to be used. Nulls may count in the maple tree because they are uh, ranges. Um, so they require space. Insufficient nodes will rebalance between the siblings and the parent nodes must be sufficient so siblings are guaranteed to exist in the rebalance case. Uh, so this may collapse the tree height of the root node if the root node ends up having an entry of one of one entry. So if you if you only have one in the root, then you can just make that one the root node and reduce the height of the tree. Uh, the rebalancing may result in two new nodes. Uh, if there's enough data that it would we would need two nodes. Uh, to contain the data, then we create two new nodes and replace them. And that would require replacement of the parent because of the RCU nature of the tree. And then that parent will be stored in the tree. Uh, rebalances where one node consumes the entire amount of the data, uh, basically the sibling is completely absorbed, uh, is an interesting case. And that's what I'm going to be looking at next. So. Continuing kind of with the same example, uh, we have a slot zero node and a slot one node, which have the minimum uh, eight entries, and they're in a root node. So uh, we walk down to where we're going to be uh, storing the six to 20, and we see that it spans multiple uh, slots. Uh, the pink box highlights the slots that will be overwritten by the new store. And then we calculate the size of the new node and realize that it's insufficient. Rebalancing always happens from the right. Well, it tries to happen from the right. If there's no right node, it will take from the left, rebalance to the left. But ideally, we're constantly pushing data to the left to keep the, the uh, data density high. That's uh, so that we don't uh, cause cache thrashing on the CPU. So we want this the most dense tree uh, within reason. Uh, sometimes uh, if, if, if you're writing something and overwriting constantly, it will cause this jitter expand and contract, and we try to avoid that. So here we're overwriting uh, three entries with one, which will cause the, uh, the slot zero node to be uh, insufficient. So we create a new leaf node after calcul. Oh, uh, maybe I should say after calculating out that um, adding the entire uh, number of entries, we realize that this can be contained within one node. So that means we will allocate a single leaf node. We copy from slot zero node up to the insert location. Uh, we could need to copy a portion of the next slot um, or the next range including the slot and, and the pivot again. But because this one is actually going to overwrite the entire uh, slot, we don't, we don't need to do that. And then we insert the new entry with the, the new pivot. And again, if, if it wasn't fully overwriting the last pivot, we would have to copy uh, a portion of that last. And uh, we would have to copy that slot and, uh, and that pivot in, uh, which would change the range just by the nature of having the previous pivot installed. And so then we copy the remainder of slot zero. And then we copy the data from slot one into the new leaf, leaf node as well. So 
now we have all of our data accounted for. If you notice again that this, this pivot here in slot one, in the slot one node, the last pivot has been kind of pushed off, off the edge of the node. That means it's going to be the implied pivot. And the implied pivot here would have already been in slot or pivot uh, one of the root node. So it's going to be the same pivot because again, it's going to cover the same range as uh, this one node is going to cover the same range as the two nodes did previously. So we examine the parent node. We shrink things down again so that we can actually have some uh, working room. Um, the new root node uh, we allocate uh, will we copy uh, from the new root or from the old root to the new root up to the insert location. And again, this is uh, dealing with slots zero and one, so we're actually not going to be copying anything there. Uh, but then we install the new re the new leaf node uh, with the new pivot, and this new pivot again is going to be the same as uh, pivot one in the old root. And then we copy the remaining data into the new root. And again, install or replace the parent node in the tree. This particular case is uh, the root node, so it would be a whole new tree again. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. It could be uh, a node that uh, has a parent itself, and it could, in fact, become insufficient, as this one would have if it wasn't the root node. Uh, root nodes don't have a minimum um, doesn't have a number, uh, a minimum number of entries, uh, except for one, in which case it's pretty useless to have it as the root node or, a, a, yeah. So what would happen in this case, if this was actually apparent is again, we would rebalance against its siblings and perhaps consume the entire thing or not and, and install a new parent or grandparent node into the tree. So this brings us to uh, probably one of the more complicated parts of the tree, which is a spanning store. The spanning store is uh, when a write occurs that spans more than one node. Now we've seen writes occur that span more than one slot, but if it spans more than one slot in a non-leaf node, then it's considered a spanning store. It's very difficult to do because of the RCU nature of the tree. Um, it requires or may require rebalancing of the parent nodes. Um, I try to reuse any portion of the tree that can be reused. Um, it may cause an entire new tree. Uh, it may go down to one entry. You can store from zero to U long max if you really want to. Uh, and just create a tree of one pointer. Um, but this is by far the, or close to, if not the most complicated operation. And I think it will become apparent as to why that is. Um, so the first thing I had to do is try and figure out how to show this. Uh, it's It's very difficult with a branching factor of 16 to show any sizable data of a tree. Uh, so this is what I've done, I've come up with, is uh, including a minimum of eight, because that's the minimum the tree, without causing collapsing or, uh, you know, the, the rebalancing that would cause uh, nodes to be consumed by, by each other. Um, so this is a tree with height of three. Each child is about 25% uh, the size of the parent, uh, just so that they can fit on a single page or a slide. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna try and store 125 to 260. So I'm gonna overwrite a fair number of entries. And I'm showing this, I've created this zoom map down in the uh, down in the corner here, where I'm circling. Hopefully that's, yeah, it's working. Um, and so in the blue box, I've blown it up here. And you see that there's implied pivot of zero to infinite like usual. Um, and then there's a range 50, 100, 150. With writing to 125, 
uh, it's going to be writing to the second slot, slot 2012. Um, and you can see, actually, before I go into that, you can see the first child here has the implied 0 to 50. And the last child of uh, the root node has the implied one, 351 uh, to infinite. So we walk to 125, uh, which we see here by the selected pivot and selected slot. And a spanning store is detected because uh, the range of the store uh, exceeds the range of this slot. So immediately from as soon as that's seen, if it's not the root node, it could occur lower down. But if it, it when it occurs, uh, we start two walkers and we walk to both 125 and 260. So again, this is still zoomed in on the, the root node. And so we walk down and you can see here that I've created a uh, left zoom in the, uh, the blue box and a right zoom in the red box. And in the zoom map, you see that we've walked down to the uh, slot two. And uh, I think that's slot five, um, I believe anyways. So we've walked down to those children and I'm showing that I'm showing the details here, the, the implied and, and um, the limits. And then we walk down again to the children. And in the children, uh, we see uh, the actual, the, the entry, the pivot 124 and 260 have been highlighted here. And they're at different areas. It doesn't really matter as long as, uh, as long as you can find what you're going to be doing. Um, this example is uh, actually a pretty simple one in that we'll end up with enough data to be contained within a node. Sometimes it's much worse than this in that uh, if the data between these two nodes is insufficient for one node, then we need to combine other nodes uh, to the left or the right of these nodes, uh, which can become extremely complicated if these are the leftmost and rightmost node of the parents, then we have to go to cousins of nodes up to the parent and then back down and, and take data there. Uh, if, if that happens, though, the parents would have to be combined and it just kind of collapses in on itself. Even with this uh, example, we highlight, I'm highlighting here what's going to be overwritten in the left after the insert location uh, will be overwritten and in the right uh, before the insert location will be overwritten. And if we look at the tree here, highlight it in pink again will be the things that will be going away. So uh, the blue blo block here is the uh, left child that will be, that will have partial overwriting and everything in its parent uh, to the right will be, need to be destroyed. That is, uh, these particular slots will need to be freed as well as anything below them. Uh, including uh, in here is uh, another layer, a layer in the tree that will have to be modified. Uh, you can see here the yellow uh, in the zoom map of what we're looking at. Um, so entire subtrees will go away in this in this scenario. So how do we do this? Well, first we realize that this is going to contain be able to be contained in one node. Uh, so we create one leaf node and we copy up to the insert location. Again, somewhat similar to the previous operations that we did. And then we insert the new data with the, with the uh, new pivot. And then we copy from the right node to the end of uh, the right node. From the right node, we copy uh, beyond where we were, where we've overwritten. Now, notice that these were chosen specifically that we would not split uh, a particular range, but it could happen that you split a particular range, in which case um, portions would be um, copied and the pivot would be modified to change the, uh, the ranges that those particular slots uh, store. 
so then we have to walk back up and build a new uh, subtree. So I walk to the left and right uh, parents. Again, if you look at the zoom map, you can see here that I've gone up a level in the tree. Uh, and I create a new parent, a new parent node, and I copy in uh, everything uh, up to the insert location uh, of the parent data, of uh, the left parent, and then insert the new, the new leaf node with the new pivot, uh, whatever that might be, which would most likely be uh the maximum well in this case it is the maximum of the uh the right leaf node that we consumed um and then we would copy uh from the right parent the remainder that we're going to be reusing uh, into the new parent node and then we go up again a level and in the root node, we have to create a new root. And the, the box highlighted in pink, anything between the selected slots have to be destroyed, as I mentioned earlier with the uh, the diagram with the yellow box. Uh, but the ones in the selected are a little bit different in that portions of those subtrees are being reused in the new tree. So it's, it's a bit of a different operation there. Uh, so... Again, we just copy uh, the portion that won't be overwritten. We store the new parent uh, with the uh, new pivot, which again would be identical to the uh, to the pivot here because uh, now this new parent uh, has the range of all of the the ranges in this pink box. And then we copy in uh, the remainder of the new root or, or the old root into the new root. And so this is what the tree will look like in the end. You notice that the new entry here in the new root goes to the new parent, which has a new entry that goes to the new leaf. So that's kind of uh, how a relatively easy spanning store would, uh, would uh, go. And uh, that's about all of the operations that I've uh, I've prepared for this for this presentation. So there there is some other involved uh, things in in all of them, but this is a basic overview of of most of the operations that the tree needs to function. Any questions for Liam? So how, Liam, let me ask a question about this. And how would you, um, what are your best cases in terms of when you, when other kernel subsystems use this? Um, who, which subsystems would make a good um candidate to use maple tree right so most of the things that use the rb tree uh yeah so there's essential there's most users of trees in the kernel uh is either use the radix tree or the rb tree uh but they don't actually use directly the RB tree. They use the interval tree. The reason they use the interval tree uh, is because it's easier to use. Um, they don't have to write the search functionality uh, for their data because it already exists for the interval tree. Uh, the interval tree is specifically designed for overlapping uh, ranges. And most users of the interval tree don't actually have overlapping ranges. So anyone using an interval tree uh, that doesn't actually have overlapping ranges should switch to the maple tree. Uh, the other user group uh, is uh, the process, the PID IDs. Um, let me go back here. So the PID IDs uh, or allocators that need 
sequential numbering. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, those those users, uh, so here, um, use, like the PID IDs currently use the Radix tree. Mm -hmm. The Radix tree is super inefficient when you have, like, say, oh, I don't know, a process at PID 1, which never goes away, and then you leave your system running for weeks on end. Your The PIDs usually have, uh, like, 1, and then maybe 5, 6, and then something around 13, 14, 30, and then it becomes extremely sparse, and you have something way out on the end of the spectrum of, of 3,000, 30,000, whatever, because your system's been running through the PIDs, and you keep it, you keep getting new ones, um, and the uh, a lot of the short-lived processes have died. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Radix tree, what happens is you end up with uh, a whole lot of nodes with very little information. Um, in an example, I, I took my running system, I had my laptop, it was running for like two weeks or something, and there was 521 running uh, processes. That in the Radix tree, based on the number, the, the PID IDs, um, or the PIDs, uh, that would be 147K used to store those 521 values. So that that's a huge waste of space, right? And when when I looked at it, there was like 115 Radix nodes with one value in them each. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in comparison, the maple tree would use 16 uh, K to store those values. And when you're trying to keep things in the cache, uh, you don't want to be have so such low data to memory usage. So anything that uses uh, sequential numbering that needs to do that sort of thing. And that's actually what LibFS was doing. And that's why they switched to the maple tree because uh, what happens instead of having huge, huge nodes with a whole lot of nulls is the maple tree will just reduce that to a single null. And here you can see these are the pivots up top and these mm -hmm. are the slots below. So we have a couple used at low a low uh, low slots, and then we have this big gap. But the big gap in the radix tree would actually be a huge number of pointers, whereas in the maple tree, it's a single pointer. Mm. So, um, so essentially, well, you're talking about sixteen k. Uh, the example you gave, sixteen uh, k. What is this? Hundred, uh, hundred and fourteen? Did you say hundred and forty? Hundred and forty seven k to sixteen k. Ah. That is yeah. that is huge, huge. Yeah, it was two hundred fifty three nodes versus sixty four nodes. So like it, it just it 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 is a huge amount of savings. Uh, but I mean, people say, well, you know, like it's one forty seven k. Who cares? But then when you start putting pushing that into your CPU cache, well, you kind of then you do care, right? And not only that, then you have a lot less dereferencing to get the things. Uh, so not only do we have a bigger branching factor, but that compression of the null entries really saves a lot of, of searching for the actual value you need. Yes, if somebody is looking at uh, looking at uh, their sub, I mean, some uh, somebody is looking at their subsystem, or somebody is looking across subsystems to see, hey, which subsystem could benefit um, from Maple Tree? Is there a easier way to tell this? I mean, you, do you have any kind of um, any kind of tool or something that you could run across the board, or do you have to have uh, knowledge of the subsystems? Uh, I think you kind of have to have some knowledge of the subsystems. Like I said, the the big the biggest indicator is well, first the IDA IDR is what this uses to do the PID stuff, and and that uh, that could benefit significantly to be switched to the maple tree, um, and it will become much better once we have dense nodes. Uh, the idea of dense nodes is instead of having pivots, we just have an array. And the array is like 31, a uh, large array. And the implied minimum is from the parent. And the maximum is just plus 31. So then you just know exactly where you're going in the, um, in the dense node uh, based on uh, what value you're looking for. But what this allows us to do 
is to increase the density of data even further than what we already have uh, when we have sequential numbers. And so once that's in place, it will be a, a great improvement in, in certain areas. And so that's one of that's basically the thing that I'm currently uh, working on uh, when I have time outside of the MM community. Uh, so anything that uses that sort of uh, that that need, the rating if if there's a subsystem that uses radix tree, then that's a candidate. And if it uses the interval tree, I mean I I can't stress enough how many users of the interval tree don't actually have overlapping ranges and thus don't actually fit the use case of the interval tree. It just so happens that it was the easiest thing to use at the time. There's also uh, people who have switched to the X-Array that may want to re-examine that and look at how the maple tree would benefit them. So those are kind of the ways if, if there's... It, if there's subsystems using that sort of thing, then they should they should re-examine their choice and see if it would be beneficial to switch. Uh, the other thing is if you're designing something new, then you might want to look at this uh, and, and how it would benefit your use case. Um, there are definitely use cases that it doesn't fit. Uh, the allocation uh, versus uh, embedded. The RB tree embeds uh, the the information within the struct of uh, your your own structure, uh, whereas the maple tree has its own nodes. So there's allocations that need to happen based on store that uh, you might not be able to uh, get around or know what's going to happen before you do it. Um, I've run into this uh, in the uh, MM uh, because we need to not allocate within a certain area of particular locks. And so there's a pre-allocation call to say, I'm going to be storing this, please allocate now. And then we take the, the locks and then we store it so that we have the necessary uh, memory put aside for the maple tree. We're working on uh, implementing that sort of thing. We're, we're working on optimizing that into the, uh, the allocator itself, the KMM cache. So we'll see how that plays out in the future, but there's definitely areas where uh, this may not fit because, because of the allocation requirements. I see. So um, I'm taking a quick look at uh, in the, you know, the tools testing, Radix tree tests. So you do have like IDR tests, all of these you're referring to are X-ray and all of those are, are they all combined, uh, all the kinds of trees? Even though it, it, I see maple also, so it looks no, like you're there, stashing all the tests there, or how how does? Yeah, so we started. Uh, what you're looking at there is the uh, user space testing. Mm -hmm. What we realized was it was taking a lot of time uh, to build up, even to run uh, tests in the kernel. And so what we did was uh, simulate uh, being. Being able to run it in user space allows us to just run GDB on on things. And uh, in the initial stages, what I did uh, was I put trace points in to say what was happening to the maple tree, what stores and what what uh, erases, whatever were happening, and I could record those and then replay them in the user space to easier debug. And then I left those uh, problems uh, as test cases. Mm -hmm. So any that anything happens, I create a new test case and I put it in so that it never happens again. Uh, so what you're looking at is the user space testing of that. There's also uh, a file in uh, lib, uh, and it's lib on a uh, test maple tree uh, file in there. And that builds as a module that can be loaded. It also mm -hmm. runs in the user space testing. So the user space testing does uh, things that I couldn't accomplish in K-unit tests, uh, as well as uh, the module. Uh, for instance, the RCU uh, threading tests and stuff are in there. Uh, so uh, there's there's a significant buildup of tests in there. Uh, and it's been rather successful to the point where uh, we're, we're copying it for the VMA testing um, as well. Uh, and... Yeah, it's it's been going uh, really well for for the way that uh, it allows us to to test uh, independent of the kernel. Uh, that 
that testing actually allowed me to rewrite uh, portions of the algorithm. And once it worked in the testing, it just worked in the kernel, uh, right. which is great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's what I'm looking. I, I did see that. Um, I, I thought that some for somebody that wants to understand this, this would be a good um, area to go and start. Um, yes, I did. I also found a live, a live uh, test. Um, there seemed to be a maple, live maple tree and also test maple tree doxy. So looks like, as you mentioned, you said that you were adding regressions. I see regression one, two, three already in the dot C's there. So th that's what you're referring to probably under um, radix tree directory. Yeah. So, so that's actually a good way to test, right? Sometimes, sometimes when you have, especially when you have, um, when uh, you are using Maple Tree for something crucial, say PIDs or live LiveFS and those kinds of things, it becomes harder to debug and test. Um, so especially this this does allow testing. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if I make a change and it breaks, uh, I won't be able to boot up to the point where something loads a module to run the tests. So it's kind of, it, it's a really good way of isolating what, um, what, uh, what is executed uh, before, you know, so that you, you don't, other things don't get in the way. Right. Um, so we do have a question in the Q and A. Um, it is a very long question. Um, is it is there a way you can look at the question, or would you like me to read that for you? Uh, I can look at it. Okay. I asked already in LPC twenty four. Would be interesting to ask you to explain it. As far as I can tell, there are users in the kernel tree that use M tree alloc range with an entry that does not really matter. Kernel BPF arena. What's important is keeping track of ranges that are allocated. I have a use case as similar, basically using a maple tree to allocate non-overlapping ranges of integers. The entry that I stored in the range does not matter. All I need to know is whether the range is free or not and allocate it and deallocate it on demand through the MT API. Assuming that's a valid use case for maple tree, what optimization could be done there and is it a simple change to try? Obviously, on a purpose allocator, the ranges of a given integer space can be written, but since the maple tree does not already, it does not seem very useful. I'm not sure. I, I don't. I didn't follow the last bit there. Lorenzo, will you be able to uh, unmute? We can unmute. Um... And then you might be able to, yeah. Okay, somebody has a hand up. So let me see who that is. Okay, yes, um, go ahead and ask the uh, question. Hi, Liam. The, the use case, and I think the arena for BPF is, I mean, there, the entry you actually store for a range is not really useful, or you need to keep track of is what ranges are in use and what ranges are not, and I think if the entry is not really useful, is there anything that mm, can be done to optimize the maple tree? I asked you already, I don't know if you understand what I'm asking. I mean, I understand it's a peculiar question, but that's a valid use case, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I'm not entirely sure it's... Uh, I remember you asking this, and I don't remember, and I, and I don't know if... I'd like to know the, more about the use case because it seems like you uh, you need to have something like what I don't understand how you would have a range and only need to know if it's used or not. You would need something to reference a particular range. There has to be something to do with the range. And it it just seems like you're missing an opportunity to use the tree to store something for quicker lookups and just using it to look up to see if it's ever been used. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I mean, you can keep track of the range. For instance, it's basically a, a device that requires a certain amount of uh, IQs, say, I don't know, 0 to 20, and you can store an index. Well, for instance, you know that uh, that range is 
allocated to this specific device, but you don't need to add an entry. But you, all you need to know is that that, that entry is uh, being allocated 0 to 20. And if you want to free it, I suppose you can free it by just passing an index to the maple tree. You don't need to do anything else. You don't need to store a pointer into the tree for that reason. Is that correct? Or I maybe I'm not understanding how to use the maple tree. Well, I just don't, uh, I mean, it's an interesting idea. And to do that, what we would have to do, if, again, I feel like it, it's missing an opportunity that, like, you have a particular IRQ and you, you should probably store something in there so that you can tell what, what it's referencing, uh, what device has that particular IRQ, uh, associated with it or, or whatever. That makes sense. I mean, I was just curious to see if there is something that could be optimized there if the information is not necessarily needed. I mean, that's what I'm asking. I understand that it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's sure. mostly a question related to how the maple, uh, how, well, how the entries in the maple tree are stored and if there is a point in not having them. I mean, is there something to optimize there? It's just curiosity, honestly. Right. So if you look, if, if, if you wanted to optimize specifically for this, we what we would do is we would put a, uh, a new leaf type in and the leaf type would be able to store more ranges because we don't actually each slot here uh, is a pointer and that's way too big. We could just use one bit and then we could increase the number of pivots. Uh, by a, a fair number right um so then you could have uh more entries per leaf node and if you have more entries per leaf node then you could uh increase the density of the tree i think actually the dense nodes would be the best plan because Yeah, I, I mean, I guess what you could do is you could make, no, no, yeah, a, a new leaf node would be the best way to do this. And what you could do is, like I said, you could, instead of having the slot be a pointer, 64-bit pointer, you would have a one bit uh, on or off. And then we could have uh, more per leaf node. And I think that would be the best way to do it. Uh, but I'm not sure there would be enough users to enable the, to to support this use case to have a new leaf node type uh, for that purpose. I understood. I mean, but you clarified and thank you very much. I understand now what you you meant. So I see the point. I uh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. We are looking at the Q&A. There is another question uh, in the Q&A. Yeah, for VMA, we have for each VMA macro defined. Some symbols in the for each VMA are GPL due to the third party kernel module can't use for each VMA. What's well, another alternative for traverse maple tree for VMA? Uh, GPL your module? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't really support out of tree modules. Um, there's definitely a find i mean there's there's uh there's a next and previous uh which will go to the next and the previous and you can do your limits check there there's a maz find which does a run from uh, a given entry to or a given uh range so you can use maz find uh, for what you're trying to do, I guess. Uh, but ideally, like you would GPL the module so that you could use all the kernel functionality. Um, there's, I've I've tried to add a number of uh, ways to do things in the maple tree similar to uh, other other data structures. I try to use previous and next 
uh, try to emulate as if a, a linked list, mainly because uh, the MM used to have the linked list for the RB tree. Um, the VMAs were stored in an RB tree, and but then the RB tree was augmented with uh, a doubly linked list for previous and next, as well as a VMA cache. Uh, to speed up accesses. And when we replaced all of that, I wanted something that could be used similar to a linked list previous and next. Uh, so really, uh, there's some tricky stuff around. If you're at the first entry and you go previous, what happens? And if after that, if you go next, what happens type thing? Um, so um, there's the operations that I tried to do uh, I tried to make it uh, logical for the user uh, that perhaps we're using previous data structures. Um, one of the functions in the MM was uh, find VMA and find VMA would start at a particular location and go upwards until it hits something. Uh, so that's implemented in the tree as well. Uh, if, if you think about if you, if you think about what uh, what I said earlier about condensing the null, the nulls into a single entry, then you would realize that find VMA, if it landed on a null, would only have to go to the next slot, which is actually pretty awesome. Um, Any more questions? No, nothing here um, in the Q&A or um, chat at the moment. Um, if you would like to share um, the, any other slides you might have, that would be, um, that'll be great too. Or, you know, so we, we do have time. If you want sure. to show. So um what I showed earlier, the uh the node wasn't entirely what is in the node. There's actually more to the node. There's metadata that can be stored in the last uh slot if uh there's room. Uh it's a dual purpose type thing. And uh, there's also a link back up to the parents so that we can walk uh upwards. Um, and in fact, the parent, because these nodes are actually 256 bit aligned, we have seven bits that we store metadata. And one of those bits in, or several of those bits actually in the, uh, in the parent pointer tells us where we are in the parent itself. Um, the metadata here, uh, would indicate the largest gap in the actually in the, in the leaf node it indicates the end of the node because when i was writing this i noticed that a lot of the time we were spending finding the end of the node and a lot of the time the nodes weren't fully full so i could store the metadata of end of node in the last slot and i can check if there's metadata by checking the last pivot if the last pivot is nothing then i know there's metadata that tells us the end and if the last pivot is something, and it is the implied pivot or the the implied pivot from the parent, then I know that that is in fact the end is the previous one. Otherwise, I know that the node is full. So there's kind of like this dual usage here of the last slot to increase the uh, the data density as well. The tree can also uh, track gaps. And this is good specifically for the VMA stuff because uh, we search to find where we can put something. We don't just say, oh, I, I want to store 10 to 20. They say, I want to store something that's 10 big. Uh, find me a location. And so we have these gaps that can be in 
the node as well. Um, and when we do this, it doesn't fully work out. So there's always room for the metadata in uh, the internal nodes. And so we call this an allocation tree because it's used for allocating. Uh, when you're using an allocation tree, you have to initialize a tree stating that it is going to be an allocation tree. And so the internal nodes are allocation nodes, which track the gaps as well as the ranges at the expense of the branching factor. The branching factor decreases from 16 to 10. But you get to find out where the biggest gap is. For instance, here we're showing that there is a gap here at uh, slot one in the in the child that's the largest, and we store the the gap size here. Um, the other thing that is stored in the metadata of this enhanced this uh, allocation node is the largest gap, and that's so that we don't we know we don't have to propagate upwards uh, to further up the tree if the, there's a particular gap that we've overwritten. We know that uh, the biggest gap has been overwritten, then we have to go up. Otherwise, we know we're OK. Um, so what we use this for is like a top-down search or a bottom-up search, depending on the architecture. Generally, it's top-down. We start at a we get a hint that uh, we want something around, I don't know, 9,000. We start at not, we've started at 9,000, we work down. Here we're saying we want something between five, 500 and 7,000, and we're searching for 30. So what we would do is, oh wait, this is uh, the metadata points to the largest gap is here. So it's almost always gonna be pointing here. Um, it's mostly used again for updates. So first what we would do when we're walking top down, we would, we would go down to 7,000. And this is what is selected here. We, we have a 20 gap with this slot and this pivot, and we're searching for 30. So 20 is insufficient. So we continue our search to the next one, 5,000. 5,000 has a gap of 50, which is sufficient. So we go down into the, into the leaf node here and we search for something, uh, from the top down to find a gap that's big enough. This one isn't big enough. We keep going and we find uh, that the area where we can store. And we return this uh, to the caller and the caller now knows where it's going to store its thing. Maybe it's actually not storing 50, uh, 30. It's gonna store, I don't know, 28 or something, but it was looking for a hole for 30 for, for some reason. Um, actually, usually it's for rounding. It, it, there's an offset and an, an alignment. And, and so they, we usually search for something a bit bigger than, than what we actually need. And then, and then we actually store it. This store happens in a different operation. So that's just kind of another uh, aspect of the tree that, that is used uh in 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 anything that uses allocations so if you need a particular gap you can find it with this tree um so the node layout um the dense node idea i think i went over this already but the idea is that there's there's no gap tracking uh there's only leaves um there's no pivots uh so it's just one to one mappings with an implied start and end, there can be multiple nulls in a row in a in a dense node. But basically, what I'm doing is um, making sure that the density stays at a particular uh, usefulness by only having so many nulls in a row, and then we will collapse back into uh, the uh, the the range nodes that we have seen previously. Uh, and this switching will actually happen automatically. So if you're storing, uh, say, PIDs, and you start with one, as usual, and you grow upwards, you will have a, a dense node, and, and then another dense node, and then another dense node. And then as things become free, you can collapse down into 
uh, an allocation node and maybe there'll be a dense node next to it or maybe it'll it'll rebalance to get enough data actually out of the dense node and maybe there won't be enough entries there and then it will change that into something else and so it's really it's going to become more of a uh, dynamic use of the nodes to increase the density of stored information Uh, so the dense nodes actually are only really something that will happen at the leaves. Uh, so it's a leaf node. Uh, and then the internal nodes will still have ranges. Uh, the other thing is that the node logical view that it shows different from the structures uh, in the code. The structures are mostly just arrays. They're not intermixed. There's not slot zero, pivot zero, slot one. It's just an array. Uh, and the tree, there's another optimization as well, where the tree may be a single pointer for zero. So if you store zero into the tree, zero to zero range of one uh, into the tree, then we actually don't create nodes. We just put a pointer to that entry. And that's really important for things like when you're uh, trying to keep track of pretty much always one thing, but then every once in a while you need more than one, then you can actually just use this and it will allocate when it needs it or most of the time won't allocate it at all. I use this uh, today in the uh, unmapping of VMAs where often it is a single VMA being removed, but uh, on boot usually actually I see one most of the time, then three, and then every once in a while I see seven, at least on x86-64, or AMD-64's machines. Uh, so the other, another piece of the tree that I kind of touched on uh, is that nodes are 256-bit aligned, and that allows seven bits for encoding information. Um, the parent and child pointers both can encode different things. Um, in the uh, child pointer, I encode the child type and uh, if there is any nulls below it, that is actually currently not used. But the idea here is in the future when we're using uh, this for the IDA, IDR uh, type allocations where we have uh, singletons, uh, sometimes you want to know if there is one PID within this range that you can reuse, and then you, you'll know uh, before walking down. Uh, that way, we don't have to use the uh, gap tracking uh, in, in to know that there is at least one entry available below in this subtree. So that's kind of a further optimization that we're looking at doing. Uh, I, I mentioned this as well, the tree iterators. There's previous and next to emulate the linked list. Uh, I also have a previous range and next range uh, because sometimes you want to go to the previous or next, even if it's null. And previous and next is kind of well understood as like a linked list operation where you go to the next entry or the previous entry, whereas previous range and next range could actually return a null. And those are uh, useful for uh, certain operations. Uh, in the VMA space, we check uh, if we can merge uh, VMAs, but it only matters if the address matches the end address and the, and the start address uh, touch. And so if the previous range is null, then we don't need to go any further than that. We also have mass for each and mass for each reverse iterators to iterate across uh, each entry. I think that was brought up in the questions. Uh, I guess it was GPL'd. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's another kind of aspect of the of the tree. Um, so the future work, uh, we want to add support for search marks. Uh, it's going to need a new node type, and it will replace gap tracking. 
This is to reach the parity with the X-ray, so we can use it for uh, shadow entries and uh, compression, compaction type things. Uh, I also mentioned kind of what the, the next point touched on, at least tree jitter. Uh, early on, what I noticed is having a strict limit of one half uh, being the minimum uh, entries. Once we went below that, this to, to seven, I guess it, it it would it would cause this flux in the tree as things collapsed in, and a lot of the time, what happens is, um, we get an entry being added and removed in a tight loop. Um, usually, this is an artificial benchmark, but it can happen, and I've seen it happen in uh, in real life, and it is extremely uh, costly to continuously do this. So we kind of had to relax the one half. And um, if it's within a certain range, it's like, I think it's only one really. It's like, if if you go to seven, then we can pack. If you go to, if, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't quite recall. If, if, if you, if you, uh, get close to the limit, then it will, it will rebalance. Uh, but it isn't as strict as, as a set number, just so that you have r wiggle room for one or two entries being removed or added. Um, there's also the idea of uh, rewriting a tree to avoid RCU overhead and recheck the SMB right memory barrier. Um, The write path uses the same code as the read path, but it might be beneficial to have two paths. I didn't really want to do this because of the volume of code that I had to write for the tree in the first place. And so I didn't really uh, want to have two paths uh, to debug in that. Uh, as the tree became becomes more stable, it might be worth looking at how much a performance win it might be. Uh, RCU isn't that big of an overhead uh, to begin with, so it might not be worth doing. I have a mailing list uh, on the maple tree that I send out a uh, periodic uh, list of things being worked on and people working on them. I've had a few people take tasks, uh, and uh, I, I have a running list of things that I uh, might that I have that uh outstanding items, I guess you would say. Um, one of them is a fuzzer tester. I'm looking for a, a I, someone wrote a fuzzer tester early on and it really helped out. Uh, but I'd like to get a better one at this point where it knows a little bit more about the tree or knows particular things as opposed to just firing in random data to find issues. Um, and I think that would be beneficial. You're looking for a little more intelligent uh, fuzzer that can probably tailor it to certain things to test. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think that would be a, a good one uh, for this. So one question for you, you uh, mentioned that um, it is RCU. Most of our trees seem to be RCU, use RCU anyway. And how does maple tree RCU usage differ from others? Sorry, which trees have RCU? RCU. I mean, the uh, RCU seem to be used. IDR seem to use RCU and RB tree does seem to use RCU. Does... Um, Maple tree use it more extensively than the other trees. Um. Well, so the RB tree uh, has RCU support, um, but the way that it works is uh, after you're done, you have to recheck what you have uh, to see if you've run off <laughs> into the weeds, um, and that's that's pretty good. But again, it relies on the person implementing the using the RB tree in their own code to know how to do it correctly. And that's kind of 
a huge barrier for <laughs> for people uh and everyone's doing it themselves and so it just kind of comes into this whole thing again um with the vmas when we were replacing the rb tree the rb tree had rcu but it also had the linked list uh our doubly linked list which caused issues uh with rcu so the maple tree is more of a, a turnkey solution for these things where we try to keep the interface pretty simple uh, and useful uh, and, and stick to the concepts that people know versus trying to get them to write their own search and RCU protection. Now, one thing is that the maple tree doesn't protect what it stores for RCU. So for instance, when, when we use when we switch to per VMA locking, uh, the VMAs had to be freed uh, RCU safely for it to be used uh, in an in an RCU manner. Um, so you do have to protect your own data with RCU, uh, but the tree itself will return either what was there uh, before or what is there now. Um, and so it's less error prone than, than than trying to use other other ways of doing it um yeah so i guess it's 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 the difference in in the ease of use is what mm -hmm. i would say okay. so you are you're kind of using you one for, like you mentioned you're not requiring users to figure out how to do searches and you're doing a lot of that except the the only thing is data protection how i think it would have been great to see the compared comparison uh, between different trees what they provide in in this presentation but you know maybe that's for and when whenever you are when you're doing another talk or webinar you could think about comparing the trees yeah, I had yeah. done a comparison a few years ago. I don't know if that's what you would be looking for, where uh, there was like a table of, of different things that. Uh, oh, that that'll be awesome. Trees. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just don't I just don't know if it would be enough of what you're looking for. I, I would have to revisit it. Um, yeah. And I mean, I guess the other thing about the, the RCU stuff is is now. This tree is becoming very well test it because of the extensive use in in the mm area as well as mm -hmm. others so it's like i mean it's, it's a good thing because a lot of the bugs are gone but it, but also it means that any bugs that exist are going to be really hard uh mm -hmm. so i mean as as all software right so it's very uh it, it was it yeah i mean it's 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 a great idea to have a a, a comparison of the trees the the density and the branching factor is by far the best. Uh, I mean, like I said, the RB tree has a branching factor of three, uh, whereas this has a branching factor of uh, sixteen or ten based on the the allocation tree. Uh, but the uh, the radix tree is is better at that, I believe. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for patiently answering all the questions. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Candice, how are we doing on time? Any other questions from the, uh, I think we have a little bit of time left. Uh, if there are any questions. Yeah, otherwise... we have about five minutes left. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A or in the chat. I'm hearing cricket, so thank you so much for this presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, we can go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you, Liam and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.